me with um, just a few words regarding this special meeting before I open up uh, public comment for items um, that are on the agenda only. Um, the recent uh, tragic deaths of George Floyd and Richard Brooks at the hands of police officers has exacerbated um, significant outrage and protests throughout the nation. Although the protests initially focused and continue to focus on police brutality against people of color and the need for police reform, the protests have further expanded out to encompass the very heart of racism and concerns over persistent inequality and disadvantage for people of color in our country. At issue is the need to focus on systemic change and the need to initiate community discussions on root cause issues that contribute to these significant injustices and inequality for people of color. The work to address these real issues is a multifaceted and multi-pronged um, initiative, not just limited to inner cities or areas more commonly known for racist attitudes and police brutality. Community members and groups, including Morro Bay, seeking change, um, have contacted uh, myself and the city of Morro Bay to better understand what we've done and what we can do on the issue of police reform. And I have called this special meeting with regard to that and a request to declare racism as a public health crisis. My response in calling this special meeting is to have our community be able to weigh in and allow our elected officials to discuss the issues at hand concerning all of us with regard to the inequalities and inequities that have existed for such a long time. With that, uh, Zeke, I will open up public comment. Uh, public comment is now open for members of the community. Public comment is for items on the agenda of this special meeting only. Do we have anybody in the queue? Yes, sir. There are a number of people in the queue, and one person Great. has their hand raised at this point. Great. Go ahead. Caller, you are online. Yes, this is Dan Sadley of Morro Bay. You're welcome, Dan. Th thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm referring to the agenda documents only, sir, and, and nothing more. Uh, my first point is every member of the city council takes an oath to support the Constitution. The background of this document says that Officer Chauvin was arrested, and that is a fact. The rest of the paragraph is factually untrue, according to the Constitution of the United States. Neither George Floyd nor Officer Chauvin were convicted of the crimes this paragraph alleges. The Constitution says that everyone is innocent unless found guilty by a jury of their peers. Therefore, this background paragraph is unconstitutional as a statement of fact. It should state that Officer Chauvin and George Floyd were suspects of allegedly committing certain crimes. Uh, Additionally, if there is to be a, a nexus between these alleged crimes uh, and, and racism, there should also have been a finding of guilt to an enhancement charge that these crimes were racially motivated which takes specific evidence to do so. In the following paragraphs, the political agenda of protesters is referenced by per capita the rates of incarceration without reference of hard facts related to per capita rates of, of crime committed by specific uh, uh, races. Specific facts are entirely lacking and political rhetoric is provided for the basis for the need of this resolution. Which, which I entirely disagree with political resolutions that aren't, that aren't based in science and fact. There, no preponderance of, of, of evidence is provided by healthcare MDs that racism is a public health crisis, which is the subject of, of, this, of this resolution. There is, there is no evidence provided. MDs are the source of, of, of the 
documenting what, what is a health care crisis and what is not. Based on the above factors, this very political resolution should be tabled or dropped based on the unconscional way it is presented and based on the lack of all facts concerning this matter. Uh, all lives matter. Black lives matter. Police lives matter. Women lives matter. Jewish lives matter. Hispanic lives matter. Asian lives matter. All lives matter. Uh, in conclusion, I, I agree entirely and support the Morro Bay Police Department and Chief Jody Cox 100% and the prudent leadership he provides. I, I believe the, the, the resolutions he provides to, to, to upgrade our police department in, in concern with the things that are happening are entirely appropriate and show his excellent leadership, as does his, his workforce. Uh, in providing uh, the, the best police force that Morro Bay could possibly have. I further believe that they are underfunded. I disagree with leaving one officer position vacant. I disagree with them being underpaid in, in regards to the rest of the community, uh, being in San Luis Obispo County. Uh, I, think, I think they actually need, need more funds, and I would like to be on record in that regard. This, this, I, I, I believe this, this, this agenda, the way it's written, is unconstitutional. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Dan. Zeke, do we have uh, any other public comments, sir? Yes, sir. We have other people in the queue. At this time, nobody's hand is raised, but we might um, tell them let that. Let me just, uh, yeah, let me just, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you do want to provide public comment and you have joined the webinar from a computer by clicking on the link, you must raise your hand um, in order to be recognized. Um, if you have called via telephone, um, there are instructions on the screen for you as to how to also um, access this meeting, and you must also raise your hand. So I'll just wait a minute. Zeke, do you have any hands raised? No, sir, not at this point. Yeah, I'll just wait. Um, Council, bear with me. I'm just going to wait for about 30 seconds to see if we get a hand up again. If you do want to weigh in on public comment um, on this issue, please raise your hand. It will be noted um, by our esteemed leadership at AGP, our video service, and uh, we will be happy to allow you to speak. Any hands, Zeke? No, sir, not at this point. All right. Thank you for that. With that, I will close public comment for this special meeting. And I'll Mayor, I, yes. Mr. Mayor, sorry to interrupt yes. you. I yes. had somebody I had somebody message me and tell me that they're trying to call in. Okay, that's great. I can wait. Have they did they indicate what the issue was? Let me check real quick. Sorry for the hold up. No, no problem. They're saying that they're getting an error message and that the site is not letting them in. Okay, um, could we get on the screen once again, um, uh, Madam Clerk, the uh, instructions? So on the screen, if you're watching this meeting um, or uh, live streaming or watching on channel 20, um, if you'd like to join the webinar and make public comment, click on the link noted in the um, information that's portrayed on the screen. You must use the raise hand feature to indicate your desire to provide public comment. You also uh, may call in by telephone. The telephone number is on the screen. And again, you must also press nine to raise your hand for public comment if you're calling in by phone. And I will wait another minute um, to see if we can get access. Zeke, anybody um, recently joined conversation and raised the hand? Excuse me, Mayor. This is, it would be star nine if you are on a dial up. Okay, great. I'm, oh, yes, I see the star on the screen. I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, folks, if you called in, it's star nine. Star nine, if you'd like to raise your hand. My apologies. And I'm getting messages that um, folks are 
not able to get in even to listen. Okay, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reopen public comment after um, the staff presentation. And hopefully, um, Zeke from AGP, if we do get callers, we do have hands raised, if we can um, let them know that we're gonna open up pub public comment again after the staff presentation, um, we can do that. Thank you, Don, for that information. So with that, Mr. Collins, let me turn it over to you for the report, thank you. Sure thing, um, and you captured the, the good introductory comments, um, Mayor, so I won't go over those again, other than to say, um, <clears throat> with respect to the comments that came in from the member of the public, uh, well taken, uh, the staff report was written the day it was published, it's typically not how we do things, but we wanted to make sure we were able to respond in a timely manner and get this, this issue before the public, so my apologies for that. Um, I won't apologize for the lack of including the massive amount of research that has been done on this issue of disparity, whether it's income, public health, um, you know, and other facets of, of human well-being. It's well documented. All you have to do is do a Google search, and you'll find literally thousands of hits on that. So I don't need to go into that and try to defend that piece. I just want to make sure that is very well understood by our community that the, the disparities do exist. Um, typically, we do like to provide those footnotes, but again, one one uh, second survey of Google will give you plenty of information um, if you're if you're really interested in understanding the issue. Um, with that in mind, um, we have brought forward a resolution that was also adopted by the city of San Luis Obispo regarding the public health crisis component of racism. Um, as we all know, a resolution alone uh, won't do anything primarily to change the issues of inequality and equities in, in, in righting historic wrongs, but it does send a strong message that we are willing to, to do the good work that's necessary to make that change. Um, and this is something that all Americans should strive to do. Uh, the resolution contains a commitment by the city of Morro Bay to engage in that work. And also, include, also this um, item could also authorize the mayor to send a letter to San Luis Obispo County Board of Supervisors and the public health officer to declare a public health crisis uh, surrounding racism. Um, the mayor also did provide a video um, message. It was posted on our YouTube um, video site, which can be uh, reviewed by the public as well. Um, and as was alluded to, our police chief, uh, Jody Cox, has done an excellent job in modernizing alongside his colleagues in the Morro Bay Police Department modernizing our police work in terms of training, in terms of professionalism, in terms of how we are accountable and transparent to our community. And we're greatly appreciative of the reforms that have been put in place um, far prior to this unfortunate incident that happened on May 25th in Minneapolis. And I applaud um, those that great work by Chief Cox. Uh, there were eight specific areas that were identified by the Eight Can't Wait campaign, in which um, surrounded mainly uh, around the issue of use of force. And uh, Chief Cox will be able to go into discussion on each of those components, as well as a few other <clears throat> items that were brought forward. And then I will touch upon um, request to better understand the options related to civilian oversight boards, as well as a question about defunding or funding of, of law enforcement. So with that, I will turn it over to Police Chief Jody Cox and I'll pick it up after he completes his component of the report. Thank you, uh, City Manager Collins. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council for, for having me and, and giving me the opportunity to speak on this topic. Uh, as, as Mayor Heading indicated, this has been a, a tragic event that has impacted all of us uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, and, and obviously, while I believe that, that California has some of the highest and stringent training standards in the nation, uh, this, this incident goes to, to show that there's still more work that needs to be done in, in our profession. Um, the state of California has enacted many new uh, legislative components to law enforcement over the last year or two, uh, especially. Uh, things like SB 1421 uh, for police records and personnel files being released to the public, uh, SB 978, which is applying our uh, department policy, which is online and posted online for our public to view. 
uh, AB 392, which was from 2019, which is a use of force policy outline that changed uh, even Penal Code Section 835A, outlining the use of force. And, and additionally, uh, the California Police Chiefs Association uh, supported uh, legislation on SB 230 for enhancing training standards and guidelines for all of California. So, so as we move forward and understanding that there is still much work to be done in addressing some of these issues, I'm going to uh, attempt to uh, touch on each one of the eight can't wait uh, issues that were put forth by a group known as Campaign Zero. In, in, in their efforts uh, to initiate additional police reforms, they've outlined eight areas. The first being requiring de-escalation the second being a duty to intervene, the third being requiring a warning before shooting, the fourth being exhausting all other means before shooting, five being requiring comprehensive reporting, six banning chokeholds and strangleholds, seven banning shooting at moving vehicles, and eight requiring a use of force continuum. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, our training standards here in California are, are, are probably the best in the nation. Uh, I come from personally from a training background uh, where I've been a trainer throughout the majority of my career, uh, which has spanned over 32 years. So I, I believe that currently your Morro Bay Police Department is one of the best trained and highest trained uh, agencies uh, that are out there. And, and we continue to train consistently. Uh, that's something that we that we f refuse to, 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 to set aside is the amount of training that we do. And it's for this reason. Th this is a prime example of why we take training so serious uh, in our agency. With, with that said, uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that the majority of these items in the 8 Can't Wait campaign are things that Morro Bay Police Department has already had uh, in, in force and within our policies and I'm going to touch on each one of those a little bit. The first one being the require, requiring de-escalation. Uh, this is also included under the new uh, bill last year, AB 392, and the use of force policies. The Morro Bay Police Department has already had a policy specifically outlining de-escalation uh, in 430.6 of our Morro Bay Police Department policy manual. And, and I won't go into that policy uh, in, in full, but it is online and available to the public to review. But that policy does require officers to intervene when they see something uh, occurring that they believe is wrong, whether that be a, an, an authorized use of force or excessive use of force. It does require our officers to intervene, uh, or I'm sorry, to, to, to de-escalate prior to that. Um, de-escalation, you have to remember, requires cooperation on the other party. So while we attempt to de-escalate every situation that we have, it, it, it is often incumbent upon the other party that we're, that we're dealing with to respond and cooperate with that de-escalation process. So again, that can be uh, further found uh, under 430.6 of our department policy. Uh, number two, that's getting into the uh, duty to intervene. Um, our department policy also incorporates under policy 300, our use of force policy, and specifically under 300.2.1, is a duty to intercede. Uh, intercede and intervene being uh, interchangeable as far as the terminology of that word. But this requires any time that one of our officers uh, is present and observes another officer using force that is clearly beyond that which is objectively reasonable under the circumstances, that officer shall intervene. And the word shell is used in the policy indicative that that officer is not uh, provided an option of whether he should or shouldn't. If he observes what he believes to be excessive force or an unauthorized use of force, it is that officer's duty to intervene and failure to do so can result in disciplinary actions. Item number three is requiring warning before shooting. Uh, and again, this is outlined in our use of force policy 300. Uh, specifically on 300.4 subsection B under deadly force uh, applications. Um, we, we provide a warning anytime force is used, and that's not just deadly force. Uh, if an officer is going to deploy uh, pepper spray or if an officer is going to deploy a taser, 
uh, we provide a warning prior to that use of force to give the subject an opportunity to voluntarily comply with an officer's orders or directives, whether that be to, 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 to put his hands up, or to turn around and place his hands behind his back, uh, any any of those efforts that we where we believe force is going to be used, uh, we provide a warning for that as outlined in policy. Under item number four, uh, the topic is exhaust all other means before shooting, uh, and this also came up in the new legislation under AB three ninety two and SB two thirty, uh, and this identifies when deadly force is justified. Uh, and 230 outlining the additional training uh, for those uses of, of deadly force. And in that outline, it set forth that the intent was that peace officers use deadly force only when necessary in defense of human life. In determining whether deadly force is necessary, the officer shall evaluate each situation in light of the circumstances and shall use other available resources and techniques if reasonably safe and feasible to do so. Now, given some of these situations are rapidly evolving, the circumstances change uh, in, the, in, in the blink of an eye sometimes, and an officer must react to whatever that circumstance and situation is. However, the policy does require that we try to use these other means, uh, alternative methods, if you would, uh, and going back to the de-escalation tactics that we utilize and try and use all of those before having to resort to a level of, of lethal force and or in this case, before, before shooting. This is outlined in the California Penal Code. Uh, it is law in the state of California and it applies to all California police agencies. Item number five uh, specifically covers requiring comprehensive recording and reporting. Um, and this, this also is covered under a use of force policy under 300.5, which is reporting the use of force. Now that specifically is designed for a use of force incident. However, our policy has several others uh, policy outlines for additional required reporting topics, such as domestic violence, hate crimes, child abuse, elder abuse. So there are several things within our department policy that officers are required to report on when they take place. Use of force is obviously one of those instances. It must be reported and documented, and it must be reported to a supervisor, and then a review is done of each use of force that occurs within the agency. I'd also uh, just outline that, as it indicates in the documentation that I provided, that this also requires that any use of force uh, is reviewed additionally by an in internal review panel uh, known as a critical incident review board. And in that, we determine if the officer's actions were within policy and were within law. So each use of force goes through that additional step of being through a curb review. Uh, number six covers, I think, one of the, one of the biggest topics uh, in the eight campaign, which is banning chokeholds and strangleholds. And as I've outlined in the document to you, uh, Morro Bay Police Department does not utilize any uh, chokeholds or strangleholds, uh, and, and nobody in the time that I've been in this agency has used uh, any method or technique like that. We don't train with those. We do have the carotid control hold, which is still in our policy, as outlined uh, for you in the document under 300.3.4. And the carotid control hold when applied correctly by a trained officer has proven to be an effective tool. Now, with that said, uh, we also have to consider how our community feels and how our community responds uh, in light of the use of this tactic or this method in other areas. And although we have not experienced a problem with that here locally, we do listen to the community and we do understand that uh, this, this particular technique uh, does have a, a, a negative connotation to it. And we are currently reviewing that in our department policy as well. Governor Newsom uh, has issued a, a directive that the California Peace Officer Standards and Training, the Commission on Post, uh, will be reviewing and removing the carotid hold from training in academies. Um, therefore, we will also be taking a look at that within our own department policy and determining if that should be removed from ours as a less lethal option. 
So there will be further review done on the issue of number six, which is the, uh, although it's listed as banning chokeholds, uh, this is a carotid hold, which is significantly different uh, than a, than a chokehold. Number seven uh, was titled as ban shooting at moving vehicles. This also is something that is uh, outlined within our department policy and has been for quite some time. Specifically under our use of force policy 300.4.1 discusses shooting at or from moving vehicles. Shooting at a moving vehicle is highly discouraged uh, within our policy uh, because shooting at a moving vehicle itself is very seldom effective. Uh, the, the problem being a, a, a vehicle in this capacity used as a weapon is very difficult to stop. Uh, and, and I would provide the context that uh, it would be considerable to uh, an active shooter situation where a subject uh, is in a, a location with a lot of people and he is intent on shooting multiple people. Uh, you're not going to try and shoot the gun out of that guy's hand. He may have multiple weapons. The idea is to stop or eliminate the threat. In the case where a subject may be using a moving vehicle as a weapon in a large outdoor gathering where there are lots of people, shooting at the vehicle itself would be ineffective. The idea would be to eliminate the threat, which would be the driver who's trying to use a 3,000-pound weapon to run down as many people as he can. So I, I believe that, that banning... Uh, this option within a policy could be detrimental, providing that we've seen multiple instances here recently where vehicles have been used as both domestic terrorist weapons uh, and in large groups of protesters. Um, it, it is outlined in our policy. It is uh, discouraged as a practice, but in a life-saving situation, you, you absolutely want an officer to have the option to, to stop the threat of somebody who may be using a large vehicle to injure as many people as possible. And that is further outlined again in our, in our department policy. Item number eight, it covers uh, requiring a use of force continuum. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit of use of force continuum, if, if you will, uh, kind of think of, of a use of force ladder. And what that concept was referring to is that you would start at the bottom rung of the ladder and you would use the lowest form of force available for the situation, that being your very presence uh, when you arrive at a scene and you're asking somebody to comply and they refuse to comply. You would then go to the next step, which may be verbal judo, where we refer to verbal commands. Now we're, we're being authoritative in our voice and in our commands and we're instructing somebody forcefully to comply and they refuse to do so. From there, you may go physically and put your hands on them to try and take them into custody. If that doesn't work, you would escalate to the next rung of the ladder, which may be pepper spray. And then you may have to respond to using a baton and then to a taser. So that is kind of what the use of force continuum, uh, that concept was designed as, is to start at the lowest level and work your way up as the need or, or resistance required. However, the new evidence-based policies that we utilize uh, we really didn't want an officer to feel that he had to go through each and every one of those steps to get uh, to a point to protect himself or to protect others. Uh, in the old days when I started, if you failed to utilize each one of those steps, uh, you, you could be sought at as having skipped a, a step and, and then being liable because you didn't use every single step. The way that some of these circumstances escalate rapidly you may not have the opportunity to go from hands-on to a taser. You may have to go from fighting for your life to lethal force in a split second, and you may not be able to try all four or five different steps uh, in a use of force continuum. The new techniques that we teach are just to create space and distance, to try and get away from the individual, to use better verbal commands, to use whatever methods may be necessary uh, to, to, to distract the subject to, to create other options and methods of techniques that would work without having to, to have a scale, so to speak, of every option that you would have to use. So it gives the officer the ability to assess the situation, determine what level of force is necessary, and then only use that level of force which is necessary to affect the arrest or to take the subject into custody or get the situation under control. 
In addition to those uh, eight issues that the campaign had outlined, we received some other uh, additional questions uh, regarding uh, law enforcement conduct. Uh, one of those was to ensure protester safety and the right to peaceful demonstration. Uh, and I think in the protest that we had here locally in Morro Bay, uh, we, we did a great job of doing that. Uh, we we kind of set an example of reaching out to the protest organizers, talking to them ahead of time, laying out clear expectations about what we wanted to have happen, what they wanted to have happen. Uh, we explained early on that our goal was to keep the protesters safe and just as importantly, to keep our community members safe. Uh, and I, I think we had a very successful uh, protest here with, with that group because we took those steps. Um, we want them to be able to express their opinions and, and, and their freedom of speech as they see fit. Our job is not to, to really interact and engage with them during the protest, uh, but to reach out ahead of time to, to, to help set the, the rules to make sure that everybody's going to be safe and that the event will be peaceful during the time that it takes place. Uh, in, in some instances, you've seen around the country where uh, that has gone completely off the tracks and officers have been forced to react uh, to different methods, whether that be less lethal using tear gas or, or, or rubber bullets or, or those types of things. Uh, sometimes the officers only have that option to react based on what the crowd does. Um, so I, I think that's been uh, addressed here. and We do a, a very good job of that here in Morro Bay. All of our officers are also trained in mobile field force techniques uh, to allow them to deal with these types of assemblies. The next topic that was addressed was to maintain continual use of body cameras uh, for use of force only when needed. The Morro Bay Police Department went to body cameras uh, several years ago. Um, we contract with a company for that. All of our body cameras, uh, and in addition to body cameras, we have in-car cameras, and those are outlined in the Morro Bay Police Department Policy 423. And, and this policy outlines when the cameras are used, uh, and again, Officers are not required to turn on the camera for every single uh, interaction that they have, but officers are to use the camera anytime a police action or enforcement action is going to take place. And with that, I mean, if the officer is getting out of his car and walking into the grocery store, the, the deli store to, to get a soda or a sandwich, he's not required. Uh, to turn on his camera, even though he might have contact with somebody. Uh, he may be walking on the Embarcadero and, and, and visiting, uh, conversing with a tourist or a pedestrian, and that's not a required uh, contact to turn on the body camera. However, if the officer has been dispatched to a call or makes a traffic stop or has any type of enforcement action that he will be involved in, or if during his consensual contacts, it turns sideways and he believes it's going to have some kind of police action, then he's required to turn on the body camera. And again, that is all outlined on our policy 423, which is included online. Uh, the next topic that is listed is to drop criminal charges against nonviolent protesters arrested during Black Lives Matter protests. And as outlined uh, in, in the document, our, our job is to, is, to enforce, is to enforce law, is to keep this community safe. Uh, we don't ever arrest anybody without probable cause, which is required under Penal Code Section 836. So if, if a subject is arrested, that indicates that they've, they've violated a law of some sort. Our, our goal then is to do it as safely and as effectively as we can. Once that arrest has been made, that subject is either issued a citation or booked into the county jail, depending on the level and circumstances of the arrest and the charges. Once that, that arrest has been made, a report is filed with the district attorney's office. And it's, it is the district attorney's office job to determine whether those charges will be filed and whether a subject will be held to answer on those charges. So in the event of, of let's say, this example of a, of a protest, if a subject was merely detained or arrested for being involved in the protest, uh, I do not see charges being filed in that type of case. If there had been an order to disperse that had been given, uh, maybe because the, the protest turned violent and several people were taken into custody for 
throwing rocks or throwing bottles or damaging property or vandalizing property. That's no longer a peaceful protest. Uh, and that type of action and that type of uh, circumstances would be documented in a report. It would be sent to the district attorney for review, and a district attorney is the one that makes the determination of if charges are filed or not. The police department does not make that determination. Uh, and with, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to City Manager Collins uh, for the last two topics, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief Cox. Um, and I got just a few pieces to cover. And then uh, as, as Chief Cox alluded to, we want to make sure there's plenty of time for um, council questions and discussion. Um, there national local community organizations have also requested that cities like City of Morro Bay form a formal community oversight or civilian oversight committee of the police department. Um, these committees can take on a variety of forms. Um, and must factor in a variety of legal, financial, and community factors. The U.S. Department of Justice did a review of police oversight committees um, in 2001 in a publication which is linked in our staff report. Um, City Council may direct staff to come back with a discussion and, and a later date to talk about the various options related to civilian oversight. Um, a critical component of that um, research is just an understanding it's a complex subject uh, where we need to understand the intersections between labor agreements, state and federal law. Um, there are many, many uh, available options out there that would need to be evaluated, um, both to understand how it fits within the unique legal and policy setting in California, as well as the city of Morro Bay, including current state and law and restrictions on access to uh, police personnel records. Um, it should also be noted that um, Chief Cox did form a citizen advisory committee in 2019, consisting of a diverse representation of our community. He meets with this committee regularly to review internal police policy and provide recommendations to the chief. Uh, in addition, uh, Chief Cox has, Cox has reinstated the Citizen Police Academy in 2019 to help inform the community of, of how modern policing works in, in Morro Bay. And lastly, he's launching the Neighborhood Cop Program to help promote um, interactions between our residents and officers to help establish a more safe community um, and really to help build relationships and trust. Um, Morro Bay Police is, is definitely moved into the, the realm of community policing or community orienting, oriented policing um, for the last five to 10 years and only been um, really pushed hard uh, since Chief Cox has assumed the role of chief back in 2019 and are really pleased with the efforts he's made, or I should say in 2018, he assumed the role. The other um, issue that's been discussed quite a bit in local, national, regional uh, media is around the, the issue of uh, quote unquote defunding police. Um, and a lot of that stems from, you know, obviously concerns about p police brutality, but also some of the other issues related to that in terms of, well, should the police be responding to these uh, quote unquote nonviolent um, interactions such as mental health issues or drug abuse or homelessness? Um, and we definitely understand that perspective. Um, certainly we would love to have uh, those uh, expert, you know, Experts in those fields respond to those calls uh, for service, but that just doesn't happen. Uh, federal federal agencies and the federal government has, has significantly ratcheted down its social service spending since back to the like, 1980s, really. And the state has had similar uh, reductions made. So typically these, these services fall um, in the hands of, of county and city uh, representation or, or agencies and a lot of times law enforcement. So our police officers have become de facto social service workers in addition to maintaining the peace in our community. So um, if our police officers do not respond to those calls that come from our community members, we don't typically generate those calls, then nobody will be responding to those calls. So we certainly encourage folks who have concerns about that to reach out to our county representatives, to our state representatives, to encourage them to look at how they prioritize their spending since they are responsible for those social services budgets. Um, it's also important to note that the city of Morro Bay, um, our staffing for our police department has declined since its height 
in uh, 2008 prior to the Great Recession of 23 sworn officers down to 18, uh, one of which is our school resource officer who's dedicated to uh, supporting the high school and elementary school. Um, and we further have um, held a vacancy, vacant position in our police officer ranks to address the impacts of the COVID-19 uh, on our, our budgets. Um, and any further reduction in staffing would certainly put us at risk to be unable to respond to emergency situations like what is transpired in Santa Cruz and Paso Robles over the past month where we lost a deputy in Santa Cruz and four officers were shot and wounded uh, in Paso Robles. Um, this definitely brings to light how quickly things can turn and when you absolutely need that, that police force to support public safety in your community. Um, and as I said, the police are typically the only agency responding to those social services calls, whether it's mental health, drug abuse, or homelessness. Um, ultimately, we will continue to do that until those other agencies are able to provide sufficient uh, staffing to do that instead of us doing those. But until such time, that is our responsibility and duty to respond to those community calls for service. Uh, that concludes our presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions that council has. Thank you, Mr. Collins, and thank you, Chief Cox. I very much appreciate not only the staff report, but also, um, Chief, your detailed response to a number of the issues that were raised by a number of organizations concerning policing and policies in general. I'm gonna just hold off on questions for a second and go back to Zeke to find out if we have anybody that does have a hand raised for public comment. I'm gonna open up public comment now again. And uh, Zeke, do we have anybody? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'm just, I just, I just, I just, I just, I just, oh. Sorry, Mr. Sorry, Mayor. I, I was there testing my uh, my connection, and I seem to be coming through okay. I was just giving you a little feedback. Here are some hands okay. raised. Okay. We're going to go ahead and open up public comment. Go ahead, please. Um, okay. Quinn, you are on the line. Hi, thank you. Um, Welcome. Thanks so much. I appreciate your time and this council for um, the report and the depth of insight you're providing to the community. And I just want to, um, I actually live in Los Osos, but without our own council, I consider you to be my leaders. And um, I just want to really say that this issue is one of the defining moments of our time. And I know it's... Um, hard when it hits the, the reality of the racism that we face in our country and locally every day when that hits in the midst of COVID and the, the recognizing the work that we have to do, but um, the work is important and it's the work that's before us. And so I just want to encourage this council and staff to keep going and to not be um, swayed by the um, the uncertainty and the discomfort that it that happens when we look at racism that we've been a part of and that we continue to uphold and that a part of that work is definitely around policing and another part of that work is around mental health and it's around education and it's around how we um, structure our communities in general and so I know that um, Race Matters and other organizations will be looking more deeply into these reports and we look forward to really um, continuing conversation with you as a community. Um, and I want to bring one of the things that was said was about um, not having adequate resources to meet if we left, didn't have as many officers to meet the moment with just PD. And I would encourage the community to more obey, to really take active steps, not complacent, not waiting for it to happen, but active steps towards putting more resources toward mental health and community supporting the organizations that already exist within our community so that we can meet those needs, those calls that come in, not just with PD presence. Let's support the organizations that are here so that we can um, meet them with the professionals that can really meet those um, crises and those conflicts with adequate resources. Um, so 
that's, I guess, all I have, but thank you for your work. And um, I look forward to seeing a lot more from this council in the coming weeks and months and years. Thank you. I think it was, was it Gwen? Did I catch that correctly? Maybe she's just connected. Sorry, well, thank you for um, the comment. It's Quinn Brady. Quinn Brady. Thank you, Quinn. Um, Zeke, do we have other public comment? Yes, sir. Next speaker is Courtney. You are on the line. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, Courtney. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you. My name is Courtney Hale. Um, I am a resident of the city of SLO, a neighbor to Morrow Bay, um, and a co-founder of Race Matters. Um, I want to thank um, the mayor, the city council, and the city staff of Morrow Bay for making the time for this special presentation today. Um, I want to thank you for responding to Race Matters and other organizations and for providing a report in response to the demands. We look forward to reviewing uh, the report and continuing the conversation. Uh, regardless of the black population of a community and the size of a community and what's happened up until this point, we believe in doing everything we can to ensure that racial profiling, police brutality, and police violence never are issues in Morro Bay. And of course, racism is bigger than policing. And we encourage you to join the city of San Luis Obispo and cities across the state and country uh, to send a strong message by offering unanimous support for adopting a resolution to affirm that racism is a public health crisis. And because we do need more than a, res a resolution, uh, we ask uh, you to join activists in urging public health officials to declare racism a public health emergency, as that's a step that can bring about needed change. Thanks so much again. Thank you, Courtney, I appreciate that. Um, Zeke, the next caller, please. Next caller, you are on the line. Hi, yes, this is Travis Ford, resident here in Morro Bay. Uh, I just want to start off by Hey, I uh, just want to start off by saying thank you so much, Mayor Heading, City Council staff, for calling this special meeting. It's 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 truly an important uh, milestone I feel for our city. So thank you for doing this. Um, you know, kind of mirroring what we said before. You know, irregardless of accusations or, in more base case, lack thereof, of the unfair treatment and. Um, prejudice against people of color, we really must do everything in our power as citizens in our community to prevent these racially motiv motivated tragedies from ever happening to begin with. Um, yeah, I, I have faith that under Morabay's current leadership, we can make great strides to be a better city. Uh, and we really must start by declaring this to be exactly what it is, a public health crisis. You know, all lives can't matter until black and brown lives do. And you know, as we've witnessed both locally, nationally, and globally, this is still something that we must really, truly work together and continue to strive for. That's it. Thank you, Travis. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, Zeke, we have another caller, sir, for public comment. Yes, yeah, sir. It doesn't seem like there's anybody else in the queue. Okay. I'll just wait one second here. Excuse me. There are people in the queue, just nobody else with their hand raised at this moment. I'll just uh, one more time ask if you would uh, if like to speak and you're in the queue. Uh, please use the raise hand button or star nine if you called in. Star nine if you called in uh, via phone or if you're on Zoom via the information given um, on the screen, use the raise hand feature. Just wait a second. Any hands raised, sir? Uh, no, sir. We just have the last caller with their hands still raised. Okay. Then I will close public comment. Um, go ahead and bring it back to council uh, for number one for questions of either Mr. Collins and um, or Chief Cox, um, perhaps I will start with uh, maybe a few general questions. And again, uh, Mr. Collins, thank you for um, your report and your oversight. Um, Chief Cox, appreciate the detailed information that you have responded to again um, on a number of issues that have been raised regarding concerns 
um, nationally about policing, community equality, equity, and issues of um, the use of excessive force. I, I do appreciate your comprehensive report. I did have uh, a few questions for the chief, if I might, Chief Cox. Um, could you elaborate on the type of um, diversity training? Um, and maybe this is a general comment for, for both Mr. Collins and uh, for Chief Cox. Pardon me. Um, for diversity training uh, that occurs within the department and or possibly within the city, Mr. Collins? Uh, absolutely. I'll speak on behalf of the police department. And, and as an example, uh, I, I, I went over these numbers uh, with my training uh, management staff uh, over the last two days. And as an example, some of the training courses that, that our officers go to, specifically speaking to these types of incidents, uh, one of them is tactical communication. Uh, one of them is crisis intervention training. One of them is racial profiling and diversity training. Uh, one of us responding to people with mental illness and other mental health related courses. We attend uh, principled policing courses uh, and additional threat assessment and de-escalation courses and other courses such as consciously overcoming unconscious bias, uh, teaching officers to work uh, even though we all have some type of, of, of unconscious bias, uh, how, how do we work around that? How do we deal with other folks who uh, we may not always be comfortable dealing with? And as an example, in the last two and a half years, um, and I say two and a half because obviously over the last six months with COVID, we've not been able to send officers to some of these training courses. But, but, but in addition, we've had over 400 hours of training in just those types of courses. So we are very committed and dedicated to training our officers with dealing with these specific issues uh, with our community. Thank you for that uh, detailed response. I very much appreciate that. Um, the second question I had had to do with, um, and maybe I'll start with a, a brief anecdote that uh, um, might give um, a comparative analysis of what I'm asking. Um, in my former life, I, I ran healthcare organizations, and um, in the very early days of healthcare, um, uh, healthcare professionals um, that worked for single organizations and uh, let's say had less than stellar records uh, with regard to clinical acumen. Um, could often, before there was action taken against license and or the organization acted on the individual, would move from one facility to another. And uh, the bottom line was there was no national database of information available regarding um, uh, clinical issues and or issues with regard to performance clinically. That all changed in the 90s. So now there is a national database for clinicians such that when any healthcare professional comes to an organization, physician, nurse, pharmacist, uh, et cetera, um, there's a national database that can be looked at to determine if there are trailing issues concerning performance. My question to you, um, given that introduction is, is there a similar database of information for police that exists, or if not, how do you vet um, um, a, a new hire with regard to the important issues of, of what I would call police competence? Uh, excellent question, Mayor. Um, and as far as I know, there is no national database. Um, I did send uh, city manager and council a detailed outline from California Police Chiefs Association, uh, which is a group that we've been working with uh, heavily throughout this process. Uh, and in that, one of the platform goals and what we call leading the way is the development of such a database as you're speaking about. And what that database would, would do is it would incorporate information on officers who are released from employment or terminated for uh, conduct or, or criminal activity or, or other things uh, that would, would put them in a national database. So no matter where they went, other agencies doing backgrounds would be able to obtain that information and then would have the opportunity to know uh, what kind of character uh, that individual had. And they would be able to look at prior disciplinary uh, issues and or criminal issues uh, that that officer may have been involved in. 
Now, more specifically for us here in Morro Bay, we go through a very detailed background vetting process. Um, each each candidate that we 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 look at their background. We look at where they've worked prior. We send uh, an investigator that goes to their neighborhoods, that talks to their neighbors, talks to their family members, talks to their employers. And we're looking for such things as personal characteristics. What kind of traits, what kind of attitude and behavior uh, does this person exhibit uh, when they're dealing with the people around them, not only on a job site, uh, because oftentimes a, an employer will just give you a, a standard recommendation that, yeah, he's a great guy. He'd be a good hire. We go a lot deeper than that. And we go into the neighborhoods. We talk to, again, family members. We talk to neighbors. Uh, we talk to all of those people to try and determine uh, what kind of person that we're looking for. And, and here in Morro Bay specifically, we're looking for a, a specific fit. Uh, we're looking for somebody that fits the dynamics uh, of our organization, but more importantly, what our community is looking for in police officers. So we have a very detailed and thorough background process. Uh, and I'll tell you, it, it can get expensive because uh, several people that we perform backgrounds on do not pass. Uh, and, and once we've gone through this very extensive and exhaustive process, uh, some of these individuals we've had to pass on, and then we start with a new candidate. Uh, until we find the one that we believe uh, is going to be beneficial for our organization and our community. Thank you, Chief, for that. Um, third um, issue that I had questions about um, being a clinician was the um, appropriate use of the carotid hold. Um, obviously, being clinically inclined, I'm very aware of the uh, vasovagal reaction and what a carotid artery hold can do. And I, I heard you um, commenting that the governor um, is in the process of banning this. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, from an equity standpoint and a concern for the safety of police and, and the effectiveness of police, if Morro Bay were to ban the use of carotid holds, what impacts would you see on your department? With an all-out ban on, on the carotid, um, it, it would be hard to tell what the impact might be. Uh, I have some officers, uh, and myself included, who have extensive experience and training in martial arts, uh, who are well-versed in, in this particular carotid hold, uh, and who have used it many, many times and, and never had a negative result, never creating a significant injury and, and never a death as associated with all of the times that we have used it. However, uh, as I mentioned, the carotid hold is something that has to be properly trained and properly executed. Uh, you know, the, the, the problem uh, in which a lot of people refer to is that in some folks who are not able to properly apply this technique, uh, if your arm slips or the subject moves, again, they're resisting, they're combative, uh, you know, it could, it could translate into a a unintended chokehold, which is why it's very important that this, this technique is only utilized by people that have been properly trained uh, in utilizing the technique and practice with the technique. Uh, the impacts of not having it, uh, again, I'll say, anytime you remove an option from an officer, you're going to force him to choose something else. Um, and, and in some cases, officers that are comfortable in applying this technique or utilizing this technique, um, if they no longer have it as an option, they're going to have to use something else, whether that be a baton, whether that be a taser, uh, or, or something other option that they would have to try and affect an arrest without providing injury. I believe statistically uh, it has been shown that the carotid hold has actually resulted in less injuries than either the taser or the baton. So removing it altogether, um, it, it's hard to say what the impacts may be uh, because, again, not, not everybody is comfortable in utilizing that technique. So it's not, it's not commonly used or frequently used, I should say. Um, but in the times that it has be, been used and by myself personally, uh, it, it's been effective. And, and I assume competency... Um uh, comes with frequency of utilization of the technique. And so obviously not using it in the field significantly. How do you maintain competency for carotid holds above and beyond the initial training? 
the the training is done through our through our uh, weaponless defense training. Uh, we send officers to self defense training, hand to hand training, obviously, and and then they're required to go through uh, perishable skills training through post. Uh, and all of this has been taught through post uh, up until this recent incident. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, where Governor Newsom announced that that he would be uh, working to remove it from the post training guidelines. Uh, our officers that attend that post perishable skills training have been trained in this technique uh, multiple times throughout those training courses, uh, in addition to other uh, weaponless defense and hand-to-hand -hand training courses. And again, it, it, the competency comes through repeated training uh, because it's not something that is used uh, as frequently as some other techniques. Got it. Uh, appreciate that explanation. Uh, the, the question comes from, um, again, my background of, you know, um, you wouldn't want to have your hip replaced by a hip surgeon that does two a year, uh, as opposed right. to the one that might do 100 a year. <laughs> Competency is usually better. So I thank you for that. Um, given the fact that you don't you know, use it in the field significantly, that explanation how you maintain competency. My last question is um, perhaps in your tenure as chief and maybe in the Department uh, of Morro Bay, um, how many documented incidents involving um, um, racism um, issues, racial issues, profiling uh, or complaints um, have there been or can you speak to that? Uh, I, I can speak to the time that I've been here and in the eight years that I've been with the organization, I'm aware of only two issues uh, that have been brought to our attention as reported as a race-related issue. Uh, and in investigating those, uh, it, it was determined that although one of the parties uh, was, was African-American, it didn't appear that the circumstances leading up to the argument, we should say, um, were based on race. Um, now, again, people can... Uh, the problem is there's just inherently some bad people out there, uh, and, and, they're, and they're not very nice. And sometimes the way they address people, the way they talk to people, uh, is, is not very kind. Uh, and, and if you're uh, in a minority group or in a vulnerable population, uh, you, you may consider that they're targeting you because of your race, when in fact they're just targeting whoever happens to be near them at the time because they're not very nice people. Um, so in both of those instances, our determination was that they were not specifically race-related. Thank you, Chief. That's uh, all the questions I have. I want to uh, go ahead and open it up to the other council members. Um, start with Council Member McPherson. Do you have any questions for Chief or for uh, Mr. Collins? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just have a couple of questions uh, for the chief. Uh, you mentioned that you look for people who are a good fit. Could you uh, tell us the qualities that you are looking for? What does that mean? What is a good fit for Morro Bay? Well, we look we look for officers who are who are have a history of uh, being compassionate, who be who have a history of being involved in their community. Uh, maybe they've been involved in other civic groups or social groups or uh, youth activity leagues or those types of things. Uh, we look for people that are that are more focused on a community uh, inspired uh, background as opposed to just a a driven stat. Uh, I want to arrest people type person. Uh, because again, you know, Morro Bay is very fortunate and very blessed uh, that we don't have a very high crime rate. Uh, so we do a lot of interaction. Uh, Morro Bay Police Department is involved in uh, nearly every event that takes place in this city, uh, every large event, uh, and then many events that are sponsored and supported by the police department, and even through the Morro Bay Police Officers Association, who, who sponsors and supports many uh, of the events themselves, uh, which is just indicative that uh, our officers are invested in the community. And when we're looking for officers, we're looking for that type of officer uh, that is not, and I'll use the term hell bent on writing tickets and taking people to jail, but, but that he knows that he's here to serve this community, to serve the public and to be responsive to the needs and concerns that they may have. Thank you for that. Um, let me ask uh, a second question that's somewhat related. How do you evaluate the performance and conduct of your officers? 
our officers are evaluated uh, each year. Um, they go through an evaluation process. Uh, a, an evaluation is completed by their supervisor. Uh, that, that evaluation is then reviewed by the commander and myself uh, prior to being sent over to City Hall for a permanent record. And we look at uh, many things. One of them, as I mentioned, is what is their community involvement? Uh, what events are they involved in? Um, we, we look at their productivity, um, but again, productivity in itself uh, as st statistical in nature is not always the driving force. Uh, the guy who writes the most tickets isn't necessarily your most productive officer, uh, but a guy that interacts with the community that, uh, as an example, we, you know, every day on our daily log, one of the topics is community engagement. Uh, and we put that on there because it, it's a philosophy and a way of life within this organization that I expect our officers and I tell them, uh, and it's kind of a joke through here, is to get out of the car, you know, that we engage with our community. And those are the things that we look for. What, what do our officers do outside of normal policing? Now, we understand they have to respond to calls for service. They have to address all of those types of needs. Uh, but, but in that downtime, what are they doing to interact with the community? And those are the things that we take all of that into consideration in an evaluation process to determine what we believe to be is productive. And have you had to uh, let officers go because they didn't meet the standards of the department? Yes, we have. Okay. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Councilmember Heller. Any questions? Yes, I do. Thank you, thank uh, you. Mr. Mayor and uh, Chief Cox. I want to thank you both and Mr. Collins for bringing this forward in a very complete and detailed staff report. Very much appreciated. I know you have a lot on your plate right now, and uh, I never cease to be amazed by uh, staff reports that you can generate uh, considering all that you have going on. And I'd like to compliment you, Chief Cox, for how you manage the uh, March a couple of weeks ago uh, as a participant. I was very impressed by how it was handled and, and I thought you and the, the support folks that you brought in just did an outstanding job with that. Um, just a sec. Sorry, <laughs> Suri is talking to me. I didn't ask her for anything, I promise. Um, Stand by, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first question I have is uh, the title of this resolution, which is... One more moment. <laughs> okay, I'm turning her off. The title of the resolution is uh, Public Health Crisis. And in another part of the report, it talks about a public health emergency. You know, I don't see safety in there. And I'm just wondering if the word choice for this is intended to perhaps uh, generate a possibility to get funding sources for specific actions that we would like to take, or uh, is that just the phrase that's being used for some purpose? And I'm, I don't know if that's a Mr. Collins question or Mr. Mayor uh, or you, uh, Chief, but I was curious about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one, Councilmember Heller, and, and thank you for um, for the compliments on, on the police work. I, I've been also been very, uh, very happy with uh, Chief Cox's approach as well as Commander Watkins when Chief Cox was was out of the office. Um, just really, really good partnership with uh, the folks who wanted to um, exercise their First Amendment right. I'm really proud of the work that they did. Uh, great question on the um, the public health crisis component. I mean, in, in many respects, it's just raising the awareness of the issue um, and, and ensuring that it isn't sort of a flash in the pan um, you know, as another incident of, of brutality takes place that we sort of go back to, to where we were before. Um, so it's just sort of raising the specter of the issue um, and asking that our public health officer um, also do the same thing as, as she's also grappling with um, another public health crisis in the COVID-19, which is having disproportionate effect on people of color across the country. Uh, so it's really just sort of raising the awareness and, and um, hoping that there can be systemic change through through that awareness. Okay, so it's not uh, those specific words were not chosen for funding opportunities per se. It, it, yes, it, it, it's uh, again raising the, the awareness, but the other pieces of those um, 
requests made by um, by by groups, you know, encompassed funding as well, um, and then that, that brought in up the discussion of law enforcement funding and potentially reallocation of funds. And uh, you know, the way our budgets work, we're fragmented, and you know, cities have responsibility for some aspects. The county has different, the state has different, the federal has different, and nonprofits somewhere in between all of that. So I think there's a connection there between the crisis and funding. Um, our, our point is, is that our, our police department is pretty, um, it's bare bones as it, as it is, and any, any further reduction would have a detrimental effect on public safety. But I think it does, those two issues are connected. So I guess the reason I ask is, I'm a little averse to resolutions that are certainly well intended, but if they're not going to help get us resources to make the kinds of changes that we all want, um, you know, I just that's that's kind of the first thought that understand came to my head. Um, I would just, uh, uh, Councilmember Hill, I'll just add yeah. um, to that because to use the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic as an example, um, if that were not declared "quote unquote" a public health crisis, the level of federal and state and county funding uh, that we have seen would never have occurred. Um, That's so what I'm it asking. Does exactly. It does raise uh, the opportunity or the bar, so to speak, to obtain funding for what I'll call systemic issues, if one believes that there are systemic issues contributing to negative public health outcomes. And so the answer is yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. And uh, uh, let's see here. My other questions, we talked about chill colds. Uh, the body cam issue is an interesting one in my mind, and I read that in great detail, Chief Cox. And a friend of mine asked me, or actually, actually, I see, you know, on the national news, you see clips of, well, what happened to the footage? Or I didn't turn on the body cam yet. You know, it's pretty clear in your your training that when to use it and when not to use it. A friend of mine said, what would it be like if every time an, an officer had an interaction with a with a citizen, say, hello, I'm Officer Heller and my body cam is on? And I thought, well, that's an interesting idea because what I always hear about, you know, what happened in the initial contact. And if you only knew about that, then you would understand the response of the officer, the officers. What are your thoughts about that, Chief? Well, that's a good question, Councilmember Heller. And, and I'll start with this. One thing to remember when we're recording uh, with a body-worn camera and or the in-car camera, all of that information has to be stored somewhere. And, and all of that storage costs money. And, and many agencies that I am uh, aware of have gone away from the body camera system because of the associated costs of storing all that data. Um, in, in addition to that, Every, every time an officer comes in at the end of their shift, and in our case, 12-hour shifts, the, the body-worn camera is going to be placed in a docking station, and it's going to download all of that information. And then at some point, that officer is going to need to go through each one of those recordings and document what that recording is for. So now we're going to have an officer spending a considerable amount of time uh, in the station on the computer uh, listing what each one of those documented recordings were for. And the majority of those recordings uh, are things that don't need to be kept. They may be just a simple uh, contact, as you mentioned, or, or a traffic stop that resulted in nothing but a warning, uh, those types of things. So that way, if we need to go back and find that information later, or that recording needs to be sent to the district attorney's office, we're able to track it through the body-worn camera tracking system. So, so that's the reason that we don't turn them on and leave them on for the entire shift. That and the fact that the equipment really isn't designed. Uh, again, those small units, the, the batteries don't typically last uh, for a full 12-hour recording session, which means we would have to buy additional batteries for every recorder that we have to be able to have that kind of, uh, of capacity. Uh, so, so a lot of it does come down to, to finances, uh, being able to store the data and have a sufficient battery life and capability to get through 12-hour uh, shifts. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that explanation very much. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts, Chief Cox, about civilian review boards in Morro Bay? Well, I, 
you know, I, I, I created the Chiefs Advisory Committee, uh, and, and that was kind of kind of my take on, on, on that process. Um, I wanted to have a, a committee of community members, a divide, diverse group uh, of community members um, who would be able to help uh, help us in guiding and kind of directing where we're going in the future. And, and that's what I utilize that Chiefs Advisory Committee for. Uh, I've, I've worked with them on several new policy developments that we're getting ready to put in place. Uh, and I've reached out to them with all of the documentation that I have sent you as council members and city manager. I've also sent that same information to my chief's advisory committee to keep them abreast of all of the changes and the planned reforms and the things that we're talking about today. Uh, and with that information, I've reached out to them and I've asked them to prepare uh, that we're going to be looking and reviewing over some of our current policies with some of the planned changes that legislation may enact in the very near future. So, so I utilize them as, as kind of that, that review board process. Um, I guess it would just depend on, on what level uh, of civilian review you were, you were looking for. Uh, that might be a, a question more geared towards the city manager of, of what he would expect a, a civilian review board uh, to be looking at or to be looking for and what he would expect from them. Okay, so is that advisory committee still in place, and how often it, do you guys meet? It's it's in place, unfortunately, with with COVID, we've we've not been able to meet in person. Uh, we still communicate via email, uh, and I'm I'm working on setting up Zoom meetings uh, with with that group. Uh, we we discussed that uh, yesterday, uh, just so that we can get back on top of some of these policies and reviewing some of the pending changes that we know are going to be coming down the pike. So they're going to be looking at the items on this particular staff agenda, uh, item here. Do you think, Chief? Yes, sir. They've received they've received this report uh, again, along with the additional documentation from California Police Chiefs Association uh, that I sent to all of the council members and city staff. Okay, great. Um, so another question for you, Chief. So it sounds like the, a national database for officers does not exist. Do you support a national database? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Absolutely, I support a national database. Do you think uh, it's uh, going to be a problem for the union, or do you think the union will say, yeah, that's well, a good idea? I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not part of the union, and I'll make that clear because we've had a lot of emails and comments uh, concerning whether myself and the commander were a part of the union, and, I, and I'll just throw that out there so everybody understands. The commander and I are not members of the police union. And with that said, uh, we have a very good relationship with our police union. And, and I think we've really been working on over the last several years uh, that I've been here, we've really been working on, again, developing a, a change in culture of, of what our officers think. Uh, and, and I don't know that that's something that they would, that they would really oppose, uh, because I think most of those officers are starting to adhere to the same uh, philosophies and, and traits that the commander and I express daily here uh, is, is that we've got to be better at the job we do. And the only way to do that is to hold each other accountable. Uh, and and we, we take that to heart. We hold each other accountable. Uh, I myself throughout my career have, have been involved in numerous uh, internal affairs and criminal investigations on officers that have resulted in their termination. Uh, so, so I, I personally uh, highly support uh, that type of database that prevents an officer from leaving one organization and joining another organization and taking those bad habits or those bad tactics or just a bad policing mentality to another organization. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, another question about the language in the resolution, and obviously I don't mean to discount the impact on African-Americans and racism uh, in this country. Uh, but I'm wondering if the language should be African-Americans and people of color uh, as part of this resolution. I've got emails from, from uh, some Native Americans and other people who I think maybe should be included. And I wonder if that was considered when this was drafted. Uh, Mr. Collins or, or Mayor Heading, can you weigh in on that? Yes. Um Absolutely could add uh, th that component if that was the pleasure of the, the city council. Uh, this is this has been uh, primarily the form uh, resolution that's been, been um, 
exchanged with cities across the country. And so there is some commonality uh, with cities that have adopted it, but I, I believe the intent would still be held true, but I'll, I'll leave that up to the council to determine if that's okay. the direction you'd like to go. Okay, thank you for that. And then my last question is, if we if the council adopts this resolution this afternoon, what specifically is going to change about how we police? I'll, I'll jump in on that, uh, Council Member Heller. And, and as I said, when we started, I'm very proud of, of your Morro Bay Police Department. And I'm very proud that all of the things that we've talked about here today are things that we're already doing. Um, that's not to say that we can't do more. And we're gonna continue to learn uh, from recent events. We're gonna continue to learn with the legislation that, that may change and may take place uh, for additional reform. But as we outlined in those eight areas uh, that were the topic of the Eight Can't Wait campaign, those are all areas that, that we've been addressing and, and we're trying to do the very best uh, that, that we can do. And, and you know, law enforcement has become a, a competitive uh, venture and, and you have turnover in these organizations and we're, we're actively always trying to recruit the very best, the highest quality candidates that we can find to bring those people into our community to work. Um, so we're gonna continue to take every step that we can to provide the absolute best police services we can provide in partnership with our community. And uh, you know our, our vision here is excellence and service. And, and our goal is to continue to provide that with everybody that we engage in this city. And, and that's tourists and, and, and uh, community members, visitors, you know, all, all of those people. Uh, the motto that we've instilled here over the last year is, is represent well. Uh, and you may have heard that as a member in our, in our uh, Citizens Academy, you know, every, every individual in this organization is, is deemed to be a leader. Uh, and that's what I expect of them. Uh, and, and if I can continue to instill that philosophy within our individuals and our staff here, we're gonna continue to improve upon the services we provide to this community. Well, I, I appreciate your leadership. And one thing you said earlier, it struck me, that you ask your officers or, or ask that they do is get out of your car. And uh, it sounds like a very simple thing, but it really struck me. And uh, please continue with, with that direction. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Council Member Heller. Council Member Davis, sir. Thank you. Council Member Davis, question, sir. Yes, thank you very much. And, um, Chief, I appreciate your answering the questions that I sent to you before the meeting and um, and you incorporated uh, your answers into your presentation, so I'm not going to dwell on those any longer. But a couple of uh, things I do want to ask about, and one is the neighborhood cop program that you uh, mentioned. We already have in place in Morro Bay a neighborhood watch program. So can you talk about the, uh, the difference between neighborhood cop and neighborhood watch and when you expect to initiate the neighborhood cop program. Yeah, absolutely. And again, great great question, Council Member Davis. The neighborhood watch program is, is an old concept. It's been around for a long, long time and it's, it's incorporated in many communities. And the neighborhood watch uh, concept is really neighbors within a small community uh, interacting with each other, joining, joining together, becoming familiar with their neighbor, kind of being the eyes and ears of police in that neighborhood, watching for suspicious activity uh, and, and being able to report that to police and that kind of think about, about keeping a, a small inclusive neighborhood. Uh, the neighborhood cop program is something that's developed by the organization for the community as a whole. So even if you're not living in a specific neighborhood, uh, the, the design behind this program is that officers are going to be assigned to a specific geographical location or beat, if you would. And anybody that logs onto this program, it's going to be a web-based app uh, that you'll be able to log on to. Uh, depending on where your geographical location is, when you log on, it's going to say, hey, Officer A is your neighborhood cop. Uh, you're going to be able to reach out and communicate directly with Officer A. 
Maybe it's questions you have about quality of life issues uh, just in your neighborhood, barking dogs or an unruly neighbor or uh, that car that's been abandoned in the neighbor's front yard sitting on blocks for three weeks. <laughs> Those types of things, we want, we want the community to be able to reach out and get to personally know and interact and build relationships with the officers. And the Neighborhood Cop Program is going to be able to do that. Uh, you'll be able to interact with the officer. Uh, each supervisor will, will have oversight uh, to make sure that when, a, when a, a, a community member reaches out to an officer, that the officer is responding. Uh, and again, as our officers work 12-hour shifts, he may be on a three-day off period. Uh, but if somebody sends in a request to talk to an officer, there will be at least two officers assigned to each location. So if one officer is on his days off, a second officer will be able to pick up that request and answer it in a timely manner. And then the, the oversight by the supervisor and the commander will ensure that all of those responses are, are, uh, are answered uh, accordingly. So there will be some other features within that app. Um, as I mentioned in my response to you, we're, we've been working on this for quite a while. Uh, Commander Watkins has done a phenomenal job on, on putting together the final details on it, and we're hoping to be able to launch the program for testing this week. Um, we're going we're gonna to test it with some of our internal components, being our Neighborhood Watch uh, members and our Chiefs Advisory Committee members, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we work out the bugs, work out the kinks of this mm -hmm. app, as with any computer-based program. We want to make sure... Uh, that, that it works before we launch it to the public, hopefully within another week or so. Uh, in addition, we're going to have the ability for people to contact us directly through this app, but also give us the opportunity to push out notifications and push out information to everybody that signs up. So you, you'll be able to receive information. If we have a, uh, an active shooter event or we require a school lockdown, or, or anything like that, we'll be able to push that information out immediately and timely and keep our community up to date uh, based on that app process. That's terrific. Thank you so much for that. Um, and then a question, I'm not sure if it's for you or for Scott. So much of what our police officers do, their judgment in the field depends upon training, both initial and current training. And um, you said earlier that the, the post-training has been postponed temporarily because of COVID. And I know also that our officers have been working long shifts, working on their days off. And even if the training were available, have not would not have been able to attend. So what do you and um, city manager call and see as the future of the training efforts for our police department? Well, uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer that. So, so really, although some of the in-class type training courses have been suspended due to COVID, that didn't stop some of our training processes. We continue to train. Uh, Post has gone to an online platform with a lot of their training. Uh, as well as additional, there's, there's just literally dozens and dozens of police training companies out there that provide online training platforms. Uh, and we continue to, to take advantage of those opportunities. So as an example, instead of me having an officer on his day off respond to, and I'll use Paso Robles as an example, who's holding a training course, uh, I'll have that officer respond to the police department on his day off, and he'll, he'll take a training course online uh, on a video portal here. Uh, that, that also gives us an opportunity to train additional officers uh, through that process. So again, we're, we're, we've not stopped training. Uh, we've just had to adapt to some different methods of training. Uh, we also are trying to take advantage of as many train the trainer courses as we can, which means we send our experienced officers to train the trainer courses and then we have that officer come back mm -hmm. and he will then or she will then train all of the rest of our in-house officers on that particular subject matter. Terrific. OK, thank you very much. Those are all my questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Davis. Councilmember um, Addis, please. Questions? 
I just have one question, and most of um, most of what I had asked has already been answered, either through questions from other council members or um, via email. And so I want to say thank you to the chief for spending so much time on this. I know there's a lot to do. Um, I am wondering, and maybe you already answered this, I think it's more for the city manager, but does Morro Bay have any uh, mental health community resources that uh, council or that our budget could better support? One of the callers mentioned that um, they believe we should put more emphasis on supporting the mental health resources that do exist. And I understand that funding is needed from the county as well as from the state and federal levels to fully support the mental health needs across the community of Morro Bay. But is there anything else that we can do um, in regards to community resources that exists and how we might shift resources to support them? Uh, good, good question. Um, I, I know that um, the county has extended some um, resources to do more uh, critical incident training or CIT that has, it's typically specific to mental health or drug abuse responses and, or, you know, co-occurring issues with homeless population, which may be all three of those. Um, but as far as uh, direct resources, um, you know, for instance, it came from Santa Cruz and the, there was a partnership between the county and the cities where uh, they would have mental health liaisons who would, in essence, ride along with the police officer. Um, in Santa Cruz, there was a thousand homeless people lived out, out of doors, so it's a different scenario than here in Morro Bay, but nonetheless, uh, it's an example of a partnership with the city and county. Um, we've, we've requested that type of service here. We just have, have not received uh, support on the other end. And I don't think it's for a lack of trying. I just know there's a lot of competing demands at the county. Um, but there, there was an emphasis heading into this year around addressing some homeless issues at the state level. And I believe some of those funding fundings will still be available. Um, I think it's primarily around homelessness, but a lot of times homelessness and mental health uh, issues occur at the same time with individuals. So there could be some overlap there. Um, but I, I, I think a lot of it just comes down to requesting that from, from the county and state to, to look at how they allocate their funding. There isn't anything we can give, you know, the city doesn't have the expertise to say, well, we're going to create a mental health position within the city of Morro Bay. We don't have the expertise to train that oversee, or oversee that function that belongs with public health. So I hope that helps. Uh, could I add something? This is Marla Smith-Pearson. Yes, uh, I just wanted to say that um, uh, Transitions Mental Health and uh, Mental Health Professionals to the community dinners on Monday night, and they have been doing that for a couple of months at least until the COVID crisis hit. So we do have uh, a resource that is available at least uh, once a week uh, to provide counseling and mental health services. Yes, and if I can jump in here, uh, I'll just touch on uh, what Councilmember McPherson is referring to. And we do work closely with Transition Mental Health uh, with their MET team. And uh, we, we have, as City Manager Collins has indicated, we've reached out to uh, the county and some of our neighboring police agencies who have uh, a program in place where they're getting support from uh, mental health services. And we're, we're trying to, to, to be included in that program to where hopefully we can get somebody to come and spend one day a week in Morro Bay to help us address some of those issues as they come up. Um, the issue with transitions is when we respond to a call for service and it's a, basically a mental health related call and really there may not be a criminal element to it and it's just specifically mental health, uh, transitions also is working very shorthanded. And when we make that call, uh, many times they don't have any staff available to respond to Morro Bay. Uh, and that requires us to be to have to transport that person. First, they require that they be transported to a hospital for medical clearance, even though they may not be uh, talking of any medical concerns whatsoever, uh, but they require a medical clearance. So then that officer has to respond to a slow, take them to a medical facility, wait for them to be medically cleared, and then hope that a mental health uh, individual will be able to respond 
to that location and then evaluate the person to determine if they meet the effective criteria for that type of hold. Other questions, Council Member Adams. That was my only question after hearing from all of the other council members and receiving responses to my emails. That was my one that was left unanswered. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. So with that, um, we've completed council questions. I'm going to bring it back and uh, um, open it up for discussion and or um, a motion. Um, before us, we have um, a recommendation to consider approving resolution number 64-20 and then any other recommendations regarding the discussion at hand today that has occurred. And um, let's see, Council Member um, Davis, would you like to start us off? Yes. Um, if I can, sorry, <clears throat> trying to get my computer. It didn't mean to catch you like that. My apologies. No, it's my I computer. have different orders that I go in here, and, and I had sure. you first this time. Thanks. No worries. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that racism is a public health crisis, um, and I support the resolution. I think that. COVID has focused attention on the fact that um, the African-American community is disproportionately adversely affected by this pandemic, as well as many other health issues. Um, so I support the resolution. Um, and in fact, I will go ahead and move that council adopt resolution number 64-20, affirming that racism is a public health crisis and recommending that public health officials declare racism as a public health emergency. I'll second that. Oh. <laughs> so we have a motion by council member Davis uh, for approval of resolution 64-20, second by council member Heller. And um, so council member Davis, thank you for that discussion. Council member Heller, uh, your discussion, sir. Uh, I have nothing to add to that. I support uh, council member uh, Davis's uh, comments completely. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Scott Collins. Thank you, Council Member Heller. Council Member McPherson. Yes, I, I just want to say that I think we're really very fortunate here in Laurel Bay to have the police department that, we have, uh, that is compassionate and that is community oriented, and we have the leadership uh, as well. Um, and I fully support uh, the resolution. Thank you, Council Member Addis. I also fully support the resolution and I want to recognize um, my colleagues and recognize staff for their support for this and for putting this together so quickly um, and for paying so much attention to this issue. And um, I think we have a new opportunity to make a difference here. I do hope that eventually a resolution like this would lead to public funding for a health crisis. I think we're opening the door to that and I appreciate that and wanna say thank you to my colleagues for that. And I don't, I'm gonna ask a question. I don't know if it's part of this motion or not, um, asking for the letter to go to the County Public Health Office uh, officer to ask them to do the same. I'll let uh, uh, Chris uh, weigh in, but um, uh, Chris, I assume by, um, if uh, this is approved by council that um, it would automatically authorize the mayor to send the letter to uh, the county public health officer and county board of supervisors? Uh, the answer is yes. Council policies and procedures 3.1.5 expressly states that at the discretion of the mayor, uh, written communications supporting previously agreed upon policy issues by the council may be sent. Uh, if this resolution is passed, then there will be uh, council support for the 
four sections in the resolution. Uh, the first one broadly states that the city council affirms that racism is a public health crisis. So if the council passes this resolution, then uh, the mayor under council policies and procedures can send letters to public health officials, uh, officials, officers, um, other public entities expressing what the council has expressly supported through this resolution. And does you, the Chris. same, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead, Don, that's fine. Uh, does the same go for requesting funding for mental health uh, from county, state, and federal levels, or is that a separate? So, um, I think that these four sections are broad and that, um, you know, at the mayor's discretion, uh, you know, he can act upon these four sections uh, in the resolution. Um, Council policy and procedures, like I said, section 3.1.5 is uh, pretty clear and somewhat lengthy on when the mayor can or cannot send letters on behalf of the council. Uh, unless there is a broad uh, policy position taken by the council, then the mayor should not be sending those letters unless um, there's a request from an agency like the League of California Cities. Um, in that case, there's a different procedure to follow. Um, but yes, I believe that if council passes this resolution, uh, it would be clear that the intent of this is to um, seek to address the issue of racism as a public health crisis. And if the mayor wanted to uh, indicate whether he's going to send some of these letters or send a letter, he certainly could do so. Um, and that would be, you know, at his discretion under council policy and procedures. And uh, uh, Councilman Aradis, um, you have my commitment that um, if this resolution passes, that that indeed will occur, and I'll summarize in a moment. That would be my preference if this passes, that we have letters um, on both issues. I think, you know, it, 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 there's many issues that we are talking about today. Part of it is, you know, police brutality, and I appreciate the chief's time on that. Part of it is how we can allocate resources, but Morro Bay seems to not have the resources to allocate. And so we need to request resources in terms of mental health supports. And then part of it is the recognition of racism as a public health crisis, but we don't have a public health officer as part of our city. So we have to request um, that the public health officer outside of our city would declare racism a public health crisis. So. Um, I very much support it and would very much appreciate that those letters were sent on behalf of our city as well. Thank you for those additional comments. Um, I do support, obviously, the resolution. Um, I want to add, once again, my thanks to um, staff. And Ms. Collins, thank you. Uh, Chief Cox, thank you for your report. As I mentioned previously, we are proud of our police department and police force. Um, we highly value um, the service that you provide to the community, you and your staff. Um, one of our, our highest callings is to ensure public safety. I believe that not only you, but your staff are sold out to uh, making that happen with minimal use of force and um, recognizing the work that you've done to ensure that there's accountability for that um, is very much appreciated. Um, I support the resolution. In addition to that, um, my plan would be to uh, raise the issue of uh, funding that a conversation has occurred at the county level on a number of occasions in different committees that, that I have served on. There's a recognition countywide that there's a lack of state and federal funding, as well as county funding to adequately address um, social issues um, such as um, uh, drug abuse, substance abuse issues, homelessness, um, and a number of other issues that are, are really more responsive to social worker intervention or mental health worker intervention, but because of lack of funding, often falls on um, public service agencies such as police departments in communities as well as fire departments. And um, although uh, I believe there's a, a fair amount of training uh, with regard to social issues, um, that's not the primary responsibility nor the primary training of those public agencies such as PD and a fire department. And, and it makes it very difficult to, um, 
to, I think, uh, deal appropriately with a, a number of the issues that we've talked about. In addition, I do believe that um, racism and what we've talked about um, is nationally a public health issue. I believe by sending this resolution to the county, it raises the awareness as well as to the state that because it is a public health crisis that there should be funding available to address the systemic issues involved in racism throughout this country, but also uh, more specifically within our county and our communities. So um, with that, um, I will, before I ask uh, for a roll call vote, there are two items I'd like to see um, if council agrees uh, brought back for further discussion. One would be um, uh, uh, further analysis from the chief on the use of um, the carotid um, uh, hold. Um, I don't feel comfortable giving your explanation, chief, of uh, banning it at present um, because of uh, the extensive training that you have indicated that the department goes through. But I, I do have concerns about that. Um, uh, but I don't want to at this time um, um, uh, make that recommendation. I would like to hear further what happens at the state level and how that affects us at the local community level if the governor uh, does move forward to uh, remove this from training or ban this. And then uh, secondarily, um, in the future, uh, perhaps in the next few months, um, uh, further report back about your community organization and some more specifics on um, how uh, accountability uh, is built in with regard to uh, the vetting of uh, police performance issues. I don't mean uh, individual police officer uh, performance reviews, but general issues of police performance and how that process works with regard to the committee. Uh, it would be interesting to hear further information on that for me. So with that, um, I will um, ask for a roll call vote on the motion that was made by Let's see, I look back here. Um, Council Member Davis and seconded by Council Member Heller for approval of resolution 64 20. Council Member Davis. Yes. Council Mayor Hitting. Yes. Council Member Adams. Yes. Council Member Heller. Yes. And Council Member McPherson. Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you again, staff, for um, this important uh, presentation and the information you've provided. Thank you, council, for uh, weighing in on this. Uh, we've, we've begun a community conversation that I think will continue into the future. Um, that ends this meeting. The next regular meeting of the Morro Bay City Council will be in approximately 45 minutes at 5.30 p.m. this evening, June 23rd, 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. We will see you then. Thank you and have a good pleasant evening. Thank you, everybody.